few months ago over Christmas and New Year, some of you will have seen that I did a bunch of live streams with my 3D printer and for Fusion 360 and other stuff, and then I kind of just stopped. <laughs> a bunch of you have been asking me to start doing the live streams again, so let's talk about why I stopped and how this little thing is going to help me bring them back. My live streaming setup was a fairly simple affair. When I was just streaming my printer, I had my Panasonic G80 pointed at the Snapmaker 2 going into the Hollyland Mars 300 Pro transmitter. The Hollyland Mars 300 Pro receivers plugged into the Fieldworld FW279 monitor on my desk and also into an Elgato Camlink 4K on the laptop streaming out to YouTube through OBS. And if all I was doing was streaming the printer, that's a great solution. But I did a couple of Fusion 360 live streams recreating some pieces for the motorized camera gimbal and part two is on the way and that's when the headaches began. It meant I needed a second and occasionally a third camera on the live stream and more HDMI capture devices as well as desktop capture so you could see Fusion 360 on my screen as I was using it. It was an okay setup but it wasn't great. I'd have to regularly plug and unplug a whole bunch of things whenever I wanted to just use my laptop as a laptop and sometimes I'd need a reboot or two for it to detect multiple capture devices successfully. It got to the point though where I was spending like an hour just to make sure everything was up and running before I started each live stream and even then the cheaper capture devices could screw up the video signal at any moment including during the live stream. But that's why I stopped it just got to be too much of a headache. Here's why I'm starting up again. Feelworld reached out to me recently to ask if I wanted to check out the new Feelworld L1V1 multicam video switcher. It's the newest iteration of the Feelworld L1 that they released last year and it's basically four of these built into a single unit plus extra stuff. It supports up to four devices although it does only output at a maximum of 1920 by 1080 but that's fine for streaming and it lets you easily switch between them using these four big buttons on top. It also only uses a single USB socket to connect everything to my laptop so I don't have to deal with a USB hub and a bunch of separate capture cards and devices along with each of their own USB cables. So let's have a quick exterior overview of the LiveView L1V1. On the top we have the four big buttons, this T-bar, an LCD that I haven't removed the protective sheet from, and we have a couple of buttons for settings and effects and a couple of dials for sifting through them. On the back you can see that we have five HDMI sockets, four inputs and one output, along with the DC power jack. On the side we have an RJ45 LAN socket, a USB socket, audio in, audio out, and there are some strange decisions here that we'll get back to in a bit. One of the things I like about this, and most HDMI capture devices to be fair, is that you're not limited to just cameras. You can plug pretty much anything that has an HDMI output into it. Want to hook up a Raspberry Pi and capture your whole setup process? No problem. Want to connect a second laptop so that you can work on one with intense software without worrying about if it's going to slow your streaming software down or lock it up for a minute or two at a time? You can do that too. So that's the first device that I'm going to be plugging in here, which is my laptop just out of frame over there. That's going to go into HDMI input number four. I've also still got my camera set up on the 3D printer with the Holy Land Mars transmitter, so we'll plug that into HDMI input 3. I've brought one of my other cameras over just so that we can fill up the slots. That'll go into HDMI input 2 if I can find a suitable cable. And then we're going to plug the overhead camera into input number 1. So for the HDMI output, we're going to plug it into the... Fieldworld FW279 monitor. So we'll plug you into the output and we'll plug you into the input. Alrighty, so now all we need to do is plug in the power. And you can see it's a standard DC barrel jack, but it's a locking type, it screws on. And when you just push it in, nothing happens. But when you screw it down, we get power. So one thing I just briefly touched on earlier was this little LCD screen on here, which lets you see all four of your inputs. You can easily see which camera you're currently watching because it's outlined in red and you can see which camera you've got queued up to go next because it's outlined in yellow. And then you can 
use your t-bar to transition between the two the idea with the t-bar is to let you pick a camera in advance like we've just done and then when you want to switch you just slide it over from one side to the other pick another camera slide it over if you want a fast transition you slide it over quickly if you want a slow transition you slide it over slowly and if you want to fake an 80s music video you can just have it sort of between the two and have a double exposure of them both but the LCD, as I said, shows you all four of your inputs simultaneously so that you can instantly see what they're all looking at before you switch to them. You can also see this mirrored on the external monitor going out through the HDMI output as well, which lets you see all four cameras along the bottom, along with your live input and the input you're about to switch to next along the top. So this brings us over to the menu button at the top right here where you can adjust your settings. And this brings me to my first little gripe with this unit and that's the color scheme of these menus. I, like 8% of human males on this planet, I'm colorblind. The light blue they use on the LCD here to denote the currently selected menu option can be difficult to read quickly sometimes and difficult to spot exactly which option you've got selected, especially on the transitions and the picture in picture that we'll get to later. I wish there was more contrast there so it was easier to spot exactly which item you currently have selected, but other than that, it's fine. So let's go through the options and see what they do. First up, the inputs. This doesn't actually allow you to change any settings, it simply tells you what signals you've got coming into the unit. So you can see on this camera, this camera, the camera on the printer, we're all 1080p at 24 frames per second, the laptop's putting out 1080p at 60 frames per second, and yes, they disappear after a minute or so if you don't actually do anything with them. So we'll go back. <laughs> now we have the HDMI menu, and here is where we get to determine what type of output we want on the monitor. We can change the format of it, to whatever we want. I just leave it at 1080p 60 and you can change it between the preview and the program output. If you go program, it just shows you what your currently selected camera is. So if I go to camera one now, which is the overhead camera, we get that. If I go to camera number two, we get this thing down here. If I go to number four, I get my laptop. Number three, I get the printer again. We'll go back to the overhead camera. Below this, we have the USB 3 menu. Here too, we can choose between preview and program and set a separate resolution for streaming. Below this, we have audio, where you can define your audio source. And here we have six options. Embedded follows your camera around as you switch. So as we go to camera one, and then camera two, and then camera three, it'll use the microphone that's connected to those cameras and coming in through the HDMI signal. External uses the three and a half millimeter audio input on the side of the device, no matter which camera or input is selected. And then you've got input one, two, three, or four, where you can just set it to use the microphone plugged into one camera. So if I want to use the microphone for the overhead camera, I can choose that one. And then no matter which camera I switch to, it's always going to use the audio from that camera. But below this, we've got the audio bar, which is what you can see on the preview monitor here. If I turn that off, it disappears. And if I turn it on, you can see it comes on. And as I talk on this camera and the overhead camera, you can see that that audio bar and that audio bar is going up. If I say nothing, you'll see that this one's still making a noise because it's the microphone on that camera and it's picking up the noise of the printer. On the next page of menus, we have the IP address setting. Now, it, this doesn't use DHCP like most devices that connect to the internet or other networks. You actually have to specify your IP address here. Although, to be honest, the LAN part of this isn't really all that useful, as I'll explain later. Below this, we have the language and we can choose between English and Chinese. There's a reset option to bring everything back to defaults and finally an info button where we can look at the serial number, IP address, MAC address, firmware and other information on the device. But now we've got the main settings out of the way, let's look at the basic operation. As I mentioned earlier, we've got your four big buttons on top for selecting each of your inputs and this T-bar slides in between them. As well as the regular fade, we have different transition options we can use that we can access by pressing the SW button. The first option, labeled mix, is our transitions, and we have a bunch here that we can choose from, and this is where I really wish we had the contrast, because the lines are so thin that it can be difficult to see exactly which one is selected. But you can see, when we go to the transitions now, we can change these over. So the T-bar is cool, as you can see, and it's very handy if you've got a team where one person is dedicated to monitoring the live streams and switching the cameras because they can just 
go through and make sure to queue up the right camera and get it all ready and then switch it when it's needed. But for a solo performance, which is probably the majority of live streams, you're probably better off disabling this. And this is the next effects option. So if we go into mode, you can see here, we've got the mode for the T-bar. We switch over to fast. Now, if we hit a button, it just switches instantly using the transition that was selected that I'm going to turn off. <laughs> because I just want a straight cut. So there we go. So now we've got a straight cut between one camera to the next, which is what I want. You can also select a fade. And when you have a fade selected, it will use this time here to determine the duration of that fade. So if I go camera one, camera two, so that's half a second fade. And if I bump this up to three seconds, now that fade will happen over three seconds and to get rid of that so that you're just doing a straight up cut you just change your transition over to cut now when we do it it's just an instant cut between whatever you're looking at below the t-bar options we have picture and picture and this is a little confusing because there's no easy indication as to which camera you're swapping is it the main camera or is it the picture in picture camera Nobody knows. If you're not running an external monitor, it's pretty much impossible to know what's going to change. But if you are, it makes life a little easier. And this is where that T-bar can come in handy again, because it means that you can switch through your cameras to make sure you're picking the right one and then switch when you know you have. Like in this example, if I've got the overhead camera and the printer, and then I want to swap to make this the big image and this the little image, I basically have to go in here and turn picture in picture off, switch to that, then, nope, not that one, that one, turn picture in picture on, and there we go. And now I can transition over to that one. But if you're not running an external monitor, it, it's, it's difficult to really know because sometimes the small picture changes and sometimes it's the main view that changes. So it's a bit of a faff i think in a future iteration of this device it might be a good idea for feel will to put another button in there specifically for picture in picture so you can tell it whether you want to change the main view or the in picture view you'll also see at the bottom there's a little fx option but that doesn't do anything cycling through mix mode pip doing it again just turns it off the FX there is for future expansion as far as i'm aware that there, there is something perhaps coming in a future firmware update when that will come and exactly what they'll offer i've no idea but apparently it's coming so how do we hook this up to a computer well this is where these ports on the side come in the rj45 LAN socket is not what you think it is you cannot stream out the signal over wired ethernet and have the live views output as a network stream in OBS, even though that would be super handy. This is purely to get your Live Pro onto your network so that you can use the Live Pro software on your desktop to control the device. The problem is the software is not very good. Fieldworld had a fantastic opportunity here to make some cool, unique software that allows you to easily access everything on the Live Pro at your fingertips, set up custom configuration presets, perhaps even set some presets for the picture in picture to make the big and little views exactly what you want them to be, but no. The software is the exact same user interface as the device hardware itself. Literally, these little things on the side, which you'd expect to be clickable so that you can access those options directly, quickly and easily. No, they're still just indicators. Hopefully this is something that Feel will work on because right now the software is kind of useless and it makes the RJ45 socket completely redundant if nobody's going to use it. Next to this, we have the USB port, which is how we stream the video signal onto the computer so that we can bring it up in OBS. It's a USB 3 port, but oddly it's a USB type A host port. The type found on your computer or other host device but this is a client device this is supposed to be micro mini or type b or ideally a standard type c socket what's wrong with a type a host socket well in theory nothing but in reality you need this strange type a to type a cable that you can't really buy anywhere because it's completely non-standard and not part of the usb spec 
And it's super short, which means that if the device isn't literally sitting on top of your computer, you need a USB extension cable for things to actually reach. It also means if you lose or damage this cable, you're pretty much screwed and the device is useless because where do you buy a replacement cable for this if it's non-standard? I haven't seen Feel World make this cable available to purchase separately if you do damage or lose it, or you know, if you just want a longer one. So I really don't understand why Feel World didn't go with a type C socket on a device like this, even if it's limited to USB 3 Gen 1 speeds. But anyway, with that little rant over, let's plug in the cable. So one end of this plugs into your L1V1, the other end plugs into your laptop's USB port. Windows detects it automatically, it's just a standard capture device, there's nothing else you need to do but we do need to add it as a video capture device. So we'll go okay, and there we go. Now we can just go through and switch our cameras to whatever we want, and it all just comes through in OBS. We never need to touch this again. Of course, you can like add all your image overlays and you know resize it to fit it inside a UI or whatever you want to do, but other than that, that's it, you're, you're pretty much done. You don't need to do any more with OBS. You can do everything from here. Now there is one issue here that you might have noticed. The overhead camera, you know, everything's the right way up. Like this is the right way up. You can read it on here, it's upside down and you can see it as well on the capture. This is upside down, it's the wrong way. This is because of the way I've got the camera mounted. The top of the camera is here and the bottom of the camera is there. The reason I've done it this way and then I rotate it 180 degrees in post is because this is just the easiest way for me to mount the camera overhead. And there's no way to flip this around here in the L1V1. This this is something I would like to see in the future is a way to, you know, flip a camera horizontally and vertically the way you can with Feel World's own monitors. Finally, let's talk audio. The basic options in this are well, they're, they're kind of okay, I guess, but they're not great. You can see on the end here, we have a three and a half mil audio input and a three and a half mil audio output. So you can plug a microphone and headphones in here. But despite the USB socket, you can't plug in a USB microphone. There's also no way to input XLR microphones in here with phantom power. So if you want to use an overhead shotgun microphone or a cardioid condenser, you'll still need to go through a separate preamp or mixer and then feed that into the Live Pro through the three and a half millimeter socket. I'm kind of okay with that, but something I see as a big oversight is that there's no way to mix two audio inputs. For example, if you're a game streamer who wants to stream out their game as well as their microphone, there's no easy way to do that. Whether this is a hardware limitation or something that Fieldworld might be able to change in a future firmware update, I don't know. But if you want any audio options more advanced than just one input at a time, then you'll want to pick up some kind of mixer and either feed that into one of your cameras or the Live Pro itself or directly into the computer that's streaming. For my audio needs, the L1V1 is fine because I'm doing all of my own audio separately anyway. Either it's the video mic NTG plugged into the computer's USB port, or I'm going through a mixer directly into the computer's audio inputs. But this could be a big sticking point for some users who don't want to deal with extra hardware. For just switching cameras though, the Live Pro does the job much better and much easier than having multiple capture devices and having to set up a bunch of different scenes in OBS and hope you switch to the right one during a stream. Would I recommend it? Well, yeah, I would. You know, even if you have more advanced audio needs and need to get a separate mixer, the Life Pro L1V1 is cheaper than going out and buying four of these, the Elgato Camlink 4K. I mean, these are like 100 to 150 bucks each. This is like 300 total. So already just replacing four of those, this is one out on price despite all the other features and benefits that it offers, like only using one USB socket. I think the software needs a major overhaul to really make it useful for remote control and not just duplicate the UI of the interface itself. I think the choice of USB socket definitely needs to be revisited and replaced with a type C in future iterations of the unit. And I think the audio capabilities of the device need a little work, even if it's just the basic ability to mix two inputs so that you can talk over something else like a game without having to deal with separate external mixers. I also would like the whole 
camera flippy thing so that my overhead camera is the right way up. But for straight up camera switching, it does the job very well and will make my streaming life much easier going forward. And with that in mind, I'll be starting up the streams again at some point very soon. I've had a few requests for tutorials and walkthroughs in Fusion 360 and Blender for 3D printing. And sometimes it's just fun to fire up the stream, experiment in software and catch up with everybody for a couple of hours. But if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends and subscribe if you want to see more. Hit the bell to be notified when I put a new video up or start doing live streams again with my Live Pro L1V1. If you have any questions about the Live Pro L1V1 or want me to test anything with it, drop them down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.